What I want to tell you about today is essentially historical. It's the story of why and how the first computers were built. They were built to assist in the British code breaking during World War II, and in particular to make possible an automated code breaking of the German teleprinter codes, which the British called Tunny. It's a story that's much less well known than the story of the Enigma machines. Sorry, could, is it? Oh, OK. Thank you. Uh, the, it's partly because the main document, the general report on Tunney, was published only in the year 2000. In other words, this remained a secret for 55 years after the war. And indeed, when I last checked, which was a couple of years ago, the, another part of the history, internal reports, was still classified. That's to say, it was still not public. It was only available to people who had security clearance. The slightly sad thing in talking about this story here is that it has a much weaker Polish connection than the Enigma story. In the Enigma story, three Polish mathematicians played a crucial role by discovering how to break the coding done by the pre-war version of the Enigma machine, uh, Marian Ruzewski, Hendrik Zygowski, and Jerzy Grozinski. They, their work um, was, became known to the French um, security service, and the French then transferred this information to the British. And it was from that that the British work on Enigma began. So this is an independent story, the story of Tunney. At the end of my prepared slides, I have some detailed information about sources of information. So if anybody here is interested in learning more, I, I can uh, show those slides, which will give the, the details of where to look. The Tunney codes were very like Enigma in one sense, that they were broken by mathematicians who worked at Bletchley Park. This was the wartime home of the UK government's so-called Government Code and Cipher School. Actually, there's lots of stories connected with Bletchley. I'll just remind people who don't know it of one, which was that it was foreseen by the director of the Code and Cipher School that war was coming and that somewhere safe to work would be needed. And he went and bought this very large house, Bletchley Park, with his own money initially in order to ensure that there was the resource. During the war, Bletchley Park was called the Government Communications Headquarters, or GCHQ, which is the deliberately vague name. It suggested it was some sort of radio station or something like that. There was no reference to code breaking. The amusing part is that after the war, GCHQ became the official name of the agency. It was no longer called the Government Code and Cipher School. Just a cautionary note before I start telling the story, if you do decide to read up about this and get hold of the various books and accounts, be careful. Some of them mixed together, they conflate Turing's work on Enigma and his theoretical work on computing with the work on breaking Tunney and the building of the actual computer, Colossus. Tunney did play a part in the work, uh, sorry, Turing did play a work in the part on Tunney, but not the main one. And the computers were not devised following his ideas. They were built as independent ideas. So, let's explain why I'm interested in this topic. One of the bits of my career that Piotr did not mention is that for three years from 2009 to 2012, I was the director of the Heilbronn Institute for Mathematical Research. This is not in what I understand is a rather nice small town in Germany. 
It's named after a famous Bristol number theorist. And it's a department which is a partnership between the Government Signals Intelligence Agency, GCHQ, and the University of Bristol. And it's essentially GCHQ's way of continuing the Bletchley Park tradition of making use of the skills of top-class academic mathematicians. So while I was director, I wanted to organize a, meet, a visit to Bletchley Park for the members of the Institute. On that tour, we saw the reconstructed Colossus computer, the reconstruction of the original computer, and we heard a short version then of its background story. And I got very interested in that story, and it's that story I want to tell you today. But I should say, just in fairness, I'm not a, an expert on history, so I have relied on secondary sources. But one of the fascinations for me lay in the fact that when I looked into the history of Bletchley Park, I discovered that quite a number of the people I knew or had met had at one time or another worked there or been involved with it. I give some names here. It's not important to use. But if you were a UK mathematician of my generation or a bit younger, you would recognize some of these possibly as the people who taught you. So let me begin by explaining how the code worked. And I'm not going to assume that you're all mathematicians. So I'll start from the beginning, I hope. It's an example of what's called modular arithmetic. In modular arithmetic, we count by looking at the remainder after division by some fixed number, which we call the modulus. The example we all know, which we learn as fairly small children, is in telling the time. If you are asked at 10 in the morning what the clock will say three hours, uh, five hours later, the answer is three. Three, of course, in the afternoon. But what we are doing is adding five to the 10, making 15 hours, and taking away 12. So we're counting mod with a modulus of 12. So this is arithmetic with a modulus of 12. We're counting in 12s, and we're only interested in what's left over when we've used up all the 12s we can find. Now, unfortunately, 12 is not a very good modulus to use for arithmetic because it has the unfortunate property that 4 times 3 is 12, which is the same as 0 from this point of view. So it would mean that you could divide 0 by numbers which are not 0. And that's a very bad idea for arithmetic. You want to be able to divide in a sensible fashion. What mathematicians do to avoid that problem when they're using modular arithmetic is they always do modular arithmetic with a prime number as the modulus. And the characteristic of a prime number is the only things that divide it are 1 and the number itself. So if we do modular arithmetic with a prime number, we won't have any problem with this issue of having non-zero numbers which multiply to give 0. So we always use prime numbers in modular arithmetic. It's very important nowadays in computer algebra. Uh, those who are mathematicians, it's used, for example, in computing factorizations of polynomials with integer coefficients. It's also very important in internet security. Every time you use your browser and it comes up with a little padlock sign, it's using a secure exchange protocol, which depends on modular arithmetic. I can explain how that's done. It's what's called public key cryptography, if anybody's interested. But for this talk, I'm only going to need the very simplest possible form of modular arithmetic, which uses the smallest possible prime number, which is 2. Digital computers, like this one in front of me, work entirely in arithmetic modulo 2, or powers of 2. And they are therefore using storage locations that have only two possible states, which represent 0 and 1. You probably know its possible value is called a bit, which is short for binary digit. Most of the time, computers work with a whole string of digits in just the same way that if you were dealing with a large number, you would write it out as a string of ordinary digits. 
on modern computers, the more modern machines that you may own, these are 64-bit machines, so they will be using 64 bits at a time. In older machines like the one I'm using here, there will be 32 bits, and they will use those bits in the same way that you write hundreds, tens, units, and so on, using position to write a number larger than 2. So 2 itself would be represented just using 2 bits um, as uh, 1, 0. So that's 1 times t 1 lot of 2s and 0 units. In the same way that if we wrote um, TED, we had, suppose we added 5 and 5 and we got 10, we write the 10 by writing 1 in the tens place and a 0 in the units place. So you do arithmetic in twos in just the same way as you do in tens, except that each time you go up one place, instead of going up by a factor 10, you're going up by a factor 2. So 2 would be represented as 1, 0. 4 would need 3 bits. It would be represented as 1 lot of 4s, no 2s, and no 1s, total 4, and so on. If we added 1 and 1, we would get 1, 0, in other words, 2. So we'd have to carry the 2 to where the tens position is in normal arithmetic. That's all fairly straightforward. And what I, having explained what bits are and how you do modular arithmetic, I now need to explain the, how data was transferred by teleprinters. What teleprinters used was a code that had five bits. So they were using five quantities which could be a zero or a one. Actually, those were represented by punched paper tape in which they either punched a hole or didn't punch a hole. If there was a hole, it represented, uh, I think the right way around is it represented a one, and if there was no hole, it represented a zero. But it's easier to talk in modern language and use ones and zeros. There's another phrase you will come across if you look at the history. They talk about impulses. That's because the stream of the bits were referred to at the time as impulses because they were thinking of the electrical signals that transmitted them. So there was a little pulse of electricity every time there was a one. The actual code was due to Bodot, and his name is immortalized in what we still use as the measure of how fast data is being transmitted, the so-called Bode rate. However, by wartime, the code had been changed by Murray, and he changed it because um, he wanted to ensure that there was a reduced wear on the machines. So he made the more common uh, letters be less uh, painful combinations of the digits. Uh, whereas Bodot originally had designed it to make it easier for the typists to type. Now, if you use five bits, you've got five choices, five things that can be zero or one. So you've got two choices for the first bit, two choices for the second bit, so that gives you four possibilities, and so on. Whoops, sorry. If you multiply two by two by two by two five times, so one time for each of the five bits, that allows 32 possible cases. That's not good enough, because to transmit a normal message, you need 26 letters. Uh, I think in Polish you need more, but somebody can tell me what the right number is. Um, you need 10 digits, 10 different numbers, and you need some punctuation marks. So there weren't enough possibilities in this character set to send the sort of message people wanted to send. So what was done was to instead have something rather like the shift key on a typewriter or a computer which goes from upper to lower case or which changes you from your numeric keypad to your letter keypad. And these were called the letter shift and the figure shift. So there were two different sets of interpretations of the signals depending on whether you were working with the shifted figure shift or the letter shift. Since you needed to use two of the characters to do this shifting, 
That left 30 characters in each shift, 60 in total. And then if you wanted to go on further to make more possibilities, for example, to have uppercase and lowercase, you could do it by agreeing with the other end of your transmission that a particular pair of characters meant change from uppercase to lowercase or something like that. Now, I should perhaps say a word about... I've got, I'm trying to remember to be careful about when I say code and when I say cipher. In normal language, um, we confuse the two. A code simply means a way of turning the normal text into something that can be transmitted. It doesn't mean there's anything secret about it. There was nothing secret about teleprinter code. A cipher means you've transformed the original text into something that's not meant to be intelligible to somebody who intercepts a message. So what I'm going to tell you about is a machine that took the text that the uh, people wanted to have transmitted and enciphered it so that they made it into a secret message and then they would transfer that secret message, transmit it originally in fact by landlines using telegraphy so it depended on cable linking the places where the emitter and receiver were positioned but later on they used radio and that transmission of the enciphered text was done using teleprinter code but there was nothing secret about the teleprinter code you could read the string of letters that was being transmitted you just wouldn't understand them very well so here's the code not the cipher the code and I, it, there's nothing helpful about this slide except to show you what's going on you've got five bits here I've listed one two three four five for each of the characters underneath I've told you what that represents in letter shift and then what it tells you in figure shift and you'll see if you count my columns that the 16 columns in the top part of the table and another 16 in the bottom so 32 characters altogether I hope I didn't miss one or accidentally type a zero where there should be a one or something like that very easily done and down the end you will notice that there are the two sets of bits which tell the machine to change from figure shift to letter shift or vice versa so there's a blank underneath them since if you're already in figure shift transmitting the figure shift character is completely pointless just to comment on the ones that are not obvious letters punctuation marks or um, digits when it says bell it means that that rang a bell at the other end so you could alert the operator at the other end you might for example decide to send a, the bell symbol whenever the message had finished so that the operator at the other end was woken up there was another key WRU which meant who are you which meant the machine at the other end should automatically send back a message identifying themselves and so on the space carriage return and line feed are just what they would mean on a normal typewriter what was Tunny? Tunny was a generic code name that the British used for the messages which were sent using teleprinter code but having the text enciphered using a particular machine or called the Lawrence SZ40 it would appear that the 40 was referring to 1940 the year in which they were first made and that's why two years later they used what was called the SZ42 so the Lorentz machine was a machine for enciphering and then at the other end of the wire or the radio signal for deciphering uh, an enciphered plain text message sending it over a teleprinter using the Bodo Mare code so the machine was actually attached to a teleprinter and what the British did was they labelled each of the links that they detected by the name of a different fish and so the whole set were called tunny which is one of the names in English for tuna fish the reason these were important is that this particular method of sending secret messages was used between German army headquarters 
So it was used between Hitler's headquarters in Königsberg and the heads of the various armies, German armies during the war. The reason the names were those of fish probably derives from the original German name of Sägerfisch, sawfish, which referred to the sawtooth nature of the wireless signals. Now there weren't an enormous number of links or an enormous number of messages uh, compared with Enigma, which was used more tactically, used by a lower level in the German hierarchy, but they had a great strategic importance. So, here's a picture of the machine. This is the machine in its nice box. This is on the right-hand side is what you see if you uh, take the box off. And you'll see there are various wheels here which rotate, and I'll explain in a moment how they rotate and what they do. So that's the machine itself, and then it was connected to a teleprinter and connected to a radio or a telephone line. And here is a diagram of the links. I'm not sure how well you will be able to read the labels on the links. This one between Berlin and Rome is labeled Bream. This one between Berlin and Paris is labeled Jellyfish, and so on. Oh, sorry. Uh, back up a bit. Um, the Hitler moved to Königsberg, so the Königsberg links were quite important. These perch, squid, octopus, and stickleback were communications with the different German armies in Russia, and so on. That doesn't include all the links, uh, but it gives you a fair idea. And every time the British discovered a new link, they named it by a different fish. How did the enciphering machine work? Well, what it did was it fed... It, you now have five streams of bits. Each character generates five bits. So there's the first bit of the first character, then the first bit of the second character, and so on. So there are five lots of bits and it put each of them through a pair of wheels. And the pair of wheels could alter the 1 to a 0 or the 0 to a 1, depending on the way the wheel worked. I'll define exactly how in a moment. The way it worked was that each wheel had a set of cams. Here's a picture of a cam on the edge of a wheel. That was when it meant a 1. So it would make contact here with some brush which would register the fact that this was a 1. When the cam was set to the side so that it didn't make contact with the brush, um, it would mean that that was a 0. So the value of the cam on the wheel could be picked up as the cam came past the contact for the wheel. And then the way each wheel worked was that if the input bit said naught and the cam bit said naught, the output bit would be naught, and so on. And similarly, if you had a naught input and a one on the cam, you got one. The odd thing, to those who are used to normal way sums work, is that if the input bit was one and the cam bit was one, the output was naught. This is what's called bitwise binary addition. For each of the five bits, you apply this rule, but you don't carry if you get 1 and 1, which would normally be 2, you don't carry. There's nowhere to carry it to. You just make it a naught. So it's different from normal binary arithmetic, where 1 plus 1 would be, as I said, written as what looks like 10, but here it means 1, 2, and no units. In this sort of funny addition, 1 plus 1 is not 10 in binary, it's naught. And moreover, in this addition, 1 and minus 1 are the same, because it doesn't matter whether you add or subtract 1, it gives the same effect. So that's how the enciphering worked on, on a particular bit. So what they did was encode all the five bits this way, and they did it by having two sets of wheels. Each wheel, sorry, each set of wheels had five wheels, so it could, each set of wheels could encode five bits. And it amounted, for a reason I'll try to explain now, to adding to the plain text a key text, which was another string of characters, which had nothing to do with the meaning of the message. So, for example, for the single character F, the input text would, say, have the bits 10110, which is the code for F. Suppose the cams on the wheel 
that were in contact at that time, the cams on the set, first set of wheels read 10101. Then you have to add these and you will get 1 plus 1 equals 0. Here in the column 4, 1 plus 0 is 1 and so on. Those cams would actually be the code for Y. Oops. And the output from the first set of wheels would be the code for the letter O. The second set of wheels then got this output from the first set, so it received the code for the letter O. Suppose the cams on the second set of wheels read 11011, then the second set of wheels would output 11000, because again, 1 plus 1 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, and so on. And that would be the code for the letter A. So what would happen was the operator would have typed F, into the machine. That was the beginning of the text. And the teleprinter would send the letter A. So that would be enciphering the text from F to A. That's the same thing as adding to F the code for the letter C, which is 01110. So in that case, the letter of the key that had been added was C. And every setting of the wheels, every turn of the wheels, gave a different key letter. Actually, I'll correct that in a moment, but think of it for the moment that each key, each time a letter was encoded, it used a different key. So if we think, and I don't mean here that C, P, and K are individual letters. I mean now they're a whole string of letters. So if C is the enciphered string of letters, and it was intending to send the message P, which is the plain text, it amounted to adding to the plain text a string of letters which were the key, given by the way the cam was set and the way the wheels were rotated. If you add the same key again, you get the plain text back, because twice anything in this funny arithmetic is zero, modulo two. Two times one is two, which is zero. Two times zero is zero, which is zero. So Two times anything is zero. So as long as you add the same key, as long as the two teleprinters at the opposite ends were using the same key to encipher the text, everything would work. So the system required the machines at opposite ends of the transmission to share the information about what the key was. The Lorentz wheel, uh, sorry, the Lorentz machine in the end turned out to have 12 wheels. Two of them were called by Bletchley Park the motor wheels, and then there were the two sets of five that added key to the input. For reasons I'm not entirely sure about, though it leads to a rather horrible pun in English later on, they called them, after the Greek letters, psi and chi. So we actually have that the encoded ciphered text is the plain text plus whatever was on the psi wheels and whatever was on the chi wheels. The cams were set before the transmission began. Once the transmission began, the machine automatically rotated the wheels in the manner that I'll describe in a moment. The arrangement of the cams was called the wheel pattern. And I say that in the beginning of the war, the Germans set that cam pattern only once a month. So once you knew what the cam pattern was in a given month, you knew what it was for all the other messages. But for any individual message, they started the rotation of the wheels potentially in a different place. And they adjusted all 12 wheels to a setting that was the setting for the day or the setting for the message. At the beginning of the war, they communicated that setting using 12 letters, 12 indicator characters, which were sent as ordinary text, not enciphered. So when the British intercepted the message, they knew that the first 12 characters told them at what position of the wheel the wheel was going to start to encode the message. And as I said, the cam patterns were changed only every month. Later in the war, the Germans realized that was a bad idea, so they started to change it more frequently. And then in 1942, instead of sending the wheel setting, the initial positions of the wheels, by plain language that we could intercept, they used a code book, which of course they had to then circulate to all the 
uh, sites that used this, but there weren't so many of them, which was a book with lists of the possible sets of settings of the 12 wheels, and each list was given a code number, which, of course, the British didn't know. What the British did do was use what were called depths in code breaker's language. I'm saying code breaker when I really should say cipher breaker. The British knew fairly early on in the war what sort of cipher was being used from the way the indicators were sent. But the Germans were also careless enough to send what were called depths. And depth means when you send two messages or more using the same key. So the person who's trying to work out what these messages mean has the advantage of knowing that two or more messages have the same key. So if they can work out what the key is, they can decode, decipher more than one message at a time. Now in, two, in, in the very simple bitwise arithmetic we're talking about, if we have a ciphered text which is a plain text plus a key, and another ciphered text, which is another plain text, but with the same key, when we simply add them together using this binary arithmetic, the key drops out because you'll have added the key twice, and twice anything is zero. So then the ciphered text, which is what you actually intercept, you know that it's the sum of the two sets of plain text. And so if you can guess some of the text of one of the messages, that will reveal some of the text of the other messages, and it will also enable you to go back, since you know what the ciphered text said, to work out what the key was. So the way the British worked when they had a depth, more than one message of the same key, was to try what they thought would be common German words in one of the messages, and see if it gave some sensible set of letters in the other message, and then if you've got some set of letters in the other message, you may be able to go back and forth between the two messages and get more or less the whole of them. Well, here's what really happened. On the 30th of August 1941, a particular German operator retransmitted a very long message. So it was the same information and using the same indicators, so using the same key. The plain text of the two messages, however, differed. It was a very long message, and when the operator was asked to retransmit it, the operator decided to abbreviate. For example, he abbreviated number, number to NR. So the second version used more abbreviation. In other words, it was a different plain text with the same key. And Colonel Tiltman used that to decode both messages and get nearly 4,000 consecutive letters of key. And with that information, Bletchley was unable to break the earlier depths, all the cases where they had two messages which they knew had the same key. And, as I'll explain, they were able to break the whole system. I'll give a little bit of detail. I don't want to dwell on it too long. But here's, uh, it, it was an illustration of what the people who then broke messages by hand had to do and it provided the starting point for the work that led to the birth of computers. And if you want to know more details of the Tiltman break, they're given in fairly full form in uh, Jack Copeland's book. So here's a picture of, on this side, the original head of Bletchley Park. In the middle, one of the Italian experts. And on the right-hand side, Colonel Tiltman, who broke this uh, pair of depths. And here's part of what he did. Here's the encoded messages labeled C prime and C double prime here. You'll notice they start with the same few characters, which, of course, is almost inevitable since I already told you it was the same plain text. What you do then is you add those together in this peculiar kind of arithmetic. So in saying the 33rd letter in the transmitted text was a T in one of the messages, an S in the other one of the messages. When you add them together, you get Y. It's written here in lower case because that's a little bit less uncomfortable. So this is the first um, 
120 characters of the two messages and in the bottom row in each of these bits of the table are what you get when you added the two together. Well, that doesn't look very helpful, but then you try guessing a probable word and testing for its occurrence. And as an example, suppose uh, Tiltman had tried the word in German meaning secret. And the Germans uh, abbreviated their teleprinted text by using a two as a space, essentially. So he might have looked for Geheim followed by a two, sorry, followed by a two for the space. So assuming he did, at, when he got to about the 60th character in the message, here is the, his guess at the plain text. Here is the sum of the two ciphered texts. He would have got, as the possible other plain text, this set of characters, which you can easily guess is actually an Deutsch, with a two meaning a space. Further on down the message, Geheim comes up again, and he might have got Eretak, which he could guess probably meant in the, Ger the German word for military attaché. And so he carried on in that message and he probably got 29 characters or so just from this correspondence. Once you've got a few of them, you can then start filling in by going back to the other message. And he very quickly realized that the two messages were the same. That made it a great deal easier because he could guess that all he had to do to get one message from the other was shift along by however much abbreviation the operator had used. There's also a sort of pet silliness on the way Germans use this. They doubled some words. So you notice that in this fragment of the text here, they've got Geheim and then Geheim again. Um, so the doubling of that complete group, which includes the Geheim, leads to extending the plain text in the other message. And that, you know, you gradually keep going in this zigzag fashion uh, using the fact that one is shifted against the other by 39 characters at this stage. And, for example, you get another fragment here which says uh, Lager Nummer 2997. So this is site number 2997 in English. Here's the uh, German text of one message. Here's the German text of the other message, inferred by working with the sum of the two messages, which is the nonsense looking stuff that appears in the middle of these table. So that was how Tiltman did it. Here's a bit more of the output. The key thing is that he got altogether nearly 3,000, nearly 4,000, sorry, letters of key. And Bletchley tried to use that to infer the structure of the machine. Unlike Enigma, the British never had during the war any physical German machine. The Enigma machines were changed during the war, but the pre-war ones were on commercial sale, and even the British had bought some before the war. So they knew what the design was. They had, they had to guess the design of the Tunney machine entirely from the encoded messages, the enciphered messages. They did guess there were 12 wheels, because there were 12 settings at the beginning, and they guessed the whole thing used wheels in this sort of way, because they... Um, just knew, that was just how cipher machines were built. And they knew that no, none of the, there was no periodicity in Tiltman's key less than 100. So the same key letter didn't come round in period less than 100. So they could guess that each bit stream needed at least two wheels to uh, encipher it. But they didn't get any further until the work was assigned, and it's not quite clear from the accounts I've read exactly when, around October 1941, to Bill Tutt, who was a young chemist, I think he was 21 at the time, who developed an interest in mathematics and was trained in cryptography when he joined Bletchley Park. The headers that I've talked about, which explained where the wheels were set, used 25 letters in most of the positions, but only 23 in one of the positions. There were two letters that had never appeared in a setting. So this prompted Tut to look for repeats on a 25 by 23 pattern, 575. So he laboriously wrote out, remember he had to do this by hand, there were no computers. He laboriously wrote out on a grid of you know, 575 
by however many fitted. But he didn't find any periodicity. There was no repeat. What they expected was that there would be a repeat because they knew the machine depended on wheels and the wheels went round and every so and again they would come back to the same position. Luckily, and it is luck in a way, he instead realized that there were repeats, not in 575 characters, but in 574. 574 is 14 times 41. And they would expect to have a prime number appearing, 41 is prime. So we then tried to look for repeats on 41 characters, and here's what he got. If you look at this, this is a section of the Turkman key writing just the first bit of each character. And you will see that that line labelled A and this line labelled A have a section which looks identical. The lines labelled B have a section that looks identical, that's underlined here. Similarly, the lines labelled C. So from this, Tup was able to guess that the wheel that affected the first bit, one of the wheels had 41 spokes, let's call them. Working in a similar way to, on each of the five streams of bits, they worked out the whole structure of the machine. Here's a diagram of it. So the first five wheels here, they're what's called the chi wheels. Here are the second set of wheels, which they called the psi wheels. And you'll see the numbers of spokes on the wheels, 41, 31, 29. Each of them is a different prime number. The Germans thought this gave so many different possibilities to the way the keys could be set up that the whole thing would be unbreakable. And the way they moved, and this was part of the weakness, in fact, of the machine, was that the first set of wheels and the first motor wheel all moved on one step at every character in the plain text. The first set of wheels first motor wheel then decided where the second motor wheel went. Notice it had a different prime number of spokes. And that then decided whether or not the second set of wheels were moved on or stayed still. That so-called stuttering, the fact that the second set of wheels could stay still between 20 and 40 percent of the time, and the fact that the whole sets of wheels all moved together, or not, were the weaknesses that enabled the British to break the ciphers. So what happened then? Well, just that information was enough to enable a lot of code breaking, or rather cipher breaking. Included some very interesting people. Uh, Roy Jenkins, who was later the chair of the European Union Commission, um, and uh, as far as British politics concerned, the Home Secretary, the Minister for Justice. The Peter Benenson, who was the founder of the charity Amnesty, for the um, relief of political prisoners. Some people who would be better known to mathematicians or computer scientists, Peter Hilton and Donald Mitchie, both of whom joined in their late teens. In fact, all of the leaders of the main teams involved in this work, with the exception of the seniors, were aged between 18 and 24. So if you're a young student, you're probably too late already. Um, it was all done in a research section led by Ralph Tester, which was known as the Testery. And it's the details of the work of the Testery that are still, or at least were still a couple of years ago, secret. What the British did, now they understood how the machine worked, was to build their own machines that would do the same thing, so that if they knew the wheel pattern and where the cams were set, they could decode a, a message very fast. So this is a picture of one of the British tunny machines. But the key thing is that Max Newman in particular realized that um, more mechanized methods were desirable. There were the so-called bombs that had been, I think, initially designed following the Polish work, but were certainly developed by Alan Turing for Enigma. They were electromechanical. They worked by... Um, they were not using digital uh, arithmetic. They were not, in any sense, modern computers, although they would do computational tasks. But for those who are as ancient as me, you may remember you sort of had hand calculating machines where you turned a handle and it, or if you like, it's like a sort of mechanical abacus. 
Max Newman, who was working at Bletchley, was a mathematician, and it's believed that it was his 1935 lectures in Cambridge which suggested the use of machines for logical mathematical processes. It's believed that that made an important contribution to Turing's famous paper on computable numbers, the paper that started the whole of the sort of theoretical underpinning of modern computing, uh, known as, for example, included the work on the so-called Turing machine. Newman convinced the director of Bletchley Park, Sir Edward Travis, as he later was, that mechanical methods were a good idea. And Travis then appointed Newman in early 1943 to develop mechanical methods. His team became known as the Newmanry. It separated out from the uh, handbraking being done in the testery. And it included, as well as Tut, some other people whose names you probably won't know if you're not a mathematician or a computer scientist, but then Sean Wiley, Jack Good, Donald Reese. Both Newman and Tester, who headed the two teams, were described as excellent managers, despite the fact that Tester, in normal everyday life, was not a mathematician or a linguist at all. He was an accountant. Uh, he worked, f uh, I think, after the war for um, a retail store company. But they were very good at managing their staff. So here's a picture of the key people. On the left is a portrait of Bill Tutt, a little bit later. In the middle, Ralph Tester. And on the right-hand side, Max Newman. Uh, I should say my own personal collection with this, tenuously, is that uh, I was involved in uh, interactions with our computer science department at Queen Mary, which employed Max Newman's son, William, for a while. So, they carried on breaking the ciphered messages by hand, at least knowing what the machine did, but Tut realized that you could break what was called a near depth, where all the wheels had the same setting except for one, by just trying what happened with all the possible settings for the one wheel you knew which you didn't know the setting for. They also used guesses at the content. They also did that with Enigma. Uh, there was a famous story of a particular isolated location in the desert in North Africa where nothing happened. And they routinely every day sent an Enigma message machine that said something like, all quiet, you know. And the Allied armies were under strict orders not to disturb this German post in the desert because it was so useful every day to see what the key was that turned the message, whose content they already knew, into ciphered text. Then they knew what the key was for lots of other messages because the Germans all used the same keys. So the code breakers used well-known words or phrases. The Germans realized that using the same formula at the start of each message was a bad idea, so they introduced what they called quatch, which meant some introductory rubbish. But sometimes that helped the code breakers as well. For example, when it got very hot in the summer in Italy, they tended to send each other a message saying, murderous heat. But then the British could use that to help them. And similarly, they'd start with particular sequences of characters as rubbish, which again helped the code breakers. There were two further, three further things that helped a lot. One was that messages on one link were then retransmitted on another using a different key. But if you knew the text was the same, you could then use that to get keys, and then you could use the keys to get the in, in message from other messages. The messages themselves were very long because they were detailed information of instructions to army headquarters. And they often contained very formulaic information like the order of battle, you know, how many battalions, how many men, what the regiments are, or data on the state of a tank formation, or lists of the aeroplanes, or something like that, which means you're repeating the same sort of information over and over again. And that makes it much easier to decipher the message. However, in July 1942, Turing devised a scheme for getting the pattern of the cams if he knew a key. And it introduced a fundamental idea, which was what became known as the deltas, which meant the difference, or since minus and plus are the same in this funny arithmetic, two consecutive values compared. 
when the second set of wheels stay still, I'm sorry, I've lost the picture, when the second set of wheels stay still, the um, change between one character and the next, of course, will be zero. So the change there will be zero. If you guess where that happens, then you can guess where the change in the key is the same thing as the change in the first set of wheels. But you know how frequently the wheels repeat, so you can then put that same key character in at the known period of the, of the first set of wheels. If you want to know more details, it's described in the general report on Tunney. In particular, the second set of wheels stay still when the motor wheels read zero. That was known as the dotage, the number of zeros on the motor wheels. And the more zeros there were on the motor wheels, the easier the cipher was to break. And the Germans eventually realized that, but too late. What Tutt did was he took this idea of using successive bits in the message and worked out a statistical way to get the wheel setting from the coded message. It's the same as breaking the Caesar cipher. I probably should have written out what the Caesar cipher does. This is allegedly used by Caesar. The way it works is the two people at each end agree on a common word. They write out the non-repeated letters of that word. For example, if you were using the word Caesar, you wouldn't repeat the A, you'd just write C-E-S, sorry, C-A-E-S, and then you'd omit the second A and write the R. So you would have a word written out like that, and then you would fill out the rest of the alphabet by writing the ordinary alphabet in order. So the longer the key that you'd shared, of course, the less alphabet there was to write. And then you'd write the input above that. So since the first letter of the code would be C for Caesar, A would always get transformed into C. The second letter of the code is A for the second letter of Caesar, so B would always get transformed into A. That's a very simple cipher, very easy to break, because what you do is you just look at the message and use the fact that certain letters are much more common than others. In English, the most common letter is E. So you'd look for the most common letter in the ciphered text and say that that must be at the position for E. And you could do that by looking at letter frequencies, especially in a long message, and work out what the keyword had been and therefore work out the whole cipher. What Tut did was a more sophisticated version of the same idea. He noticed that if you added the bits on the first uh, Xi1 and Xi2, the first two wheels of the second set together, that had the property that it was zero about 70% of the time because the wheels moved together. He also found that for German military plain text, the change in the plain text input in the first two bits was zero about 60% of the time. That was because of the way the language worked and the way the code, the teleprinter code worked. So the change in the first two bits added together between the coded message from one character to the next agreed with the change in the first set of wheels about 55% of the time. But they knew that the first set of wheels was periodic with a, uh, in the first two bits because there were 41 spokes on the first wheel, 31 spokes on the second wheel. So every 41 times 31 characters, you got back to where you started. So you just had to compare the change in the first two enciphered characters and the possible change in the first two wheels in every one of the possible wheel settings and that would reveal which wheel setting was correct. And you could repeat this same idea on other pairs of wheels. Why did they use the first two bits? The answer is because the most common characters started either 0, 0 or 1, 1 and therefore didn't get changed between one character and the next. So those were the best choice. Note they still assumed one knew where the cams were, but that could be done by handbraking and, as it later turned out, could be mechanised. So what this did was remove the effect of the first set of wheels, the so-called chi wheels. This was known as de -chi 
What was left contained the sum of the plain text and the second set of wheels, and removing that was known, completing the process was known as deep sighing. This is where the horrible pun in English comes, because a deep sigh uh, is what you emit when you really don't know what to do next. <laughs> so the testery, the team led by Tester, did the wheel braking, setting of the cams, and it did the last stage, the deep sighing. Newman Reed did the middle bit of working out what the wheel setting was, and that's what it used the machines for. Initially it did it by having some machines that were called Heath Robinsons, after the famous cartoonist of Impossible Machines, which had two lengths of tape, one of which contained the possible settings and the other one had the cipher text. It gave big problems. They wanted to pass the tapes through the machine fast, they kept breaking, they wanted to keep the two tapes in step. It was difficult to get them synchronized. And the whole thing didn't work fast enough. It wasn't a computer. It was just an electromechanical device. Here's a picture of it. Uh, you can see here are the two rigs which contain the tape. You can see one of the tapes here. So those are the two tapes on these two large bits of rig going round and round these wheels through the sprocket holes and being read. And here's the electrical stuff that did the counting. It didn't work too well. How did this get to be involved in computers? Tommy Flowers proposed an improved machine that would only need one tape, which was the actual message that had been intercepted, the cipher message. He had the idea that you could use the sprocket holes in the tape to synchronize the electronics. And he had the idea of using valves rather than relays to do the counting. The potential success of this depended on a fact which Flowers knew, which was that valves were reliable if you ran them non-stop, if you just switched them on and never switched them off. Whereas they were very unreliable if they were turned off and on. Everybody knew that because they had valve radio sets like I did when I was a small kid. If you turn them on and off, the valves break. And the idea of building a machine with about 1,500 valves in it, which were all going to break, didn't go down too well with the people at Bletchley to begin with, because they didn't know, as Flowers did, that if they just turned the thing on and didn't switch it off, it would be OK. They were more used to Enigma bomb-style things. Fortunately, the senior people at the post office, who were Flowers' employers, approved funding for his design, although it involved untested ideas, and so they made a serious commitment, not only of money, but also of scarce human resources. The people to do this with the technical skills were certainly needed elsewhere as well. Even so, Flowers sometimes had to buy bits for the machine himself. The key thing about the design was, as I say, this was the first computer. It involved alterable programming, although the programming was done by plugging codes into a board. It involved the use of interrupts, that's to say a signal sent to the processor when it should stop and change task or wait for do something. It included synchronization of the clock pulses in the different parts of the machine. They were all synchronized to the paper tape. It included the idea of shift registered. It stored some pre-generated data, the pre-generated data for what happened with all the possible wheel settings. And it, in fact, in the later versions, it had parallel processing. It could do two lots of ciphered text at once. So here's a picture of Colossus. This is what they built. And you can go and see the reproduction of it if you're interested, whenever it happened to be near Bletchley. It does deserve to be called the first computer, although it was not a general purpose computer. as a special purpose cryptographic device. Someone has to choose one's qualifying adjectives a bit carefully. And it's interesting that many histories say that the American ENIAC, which was used in uh, their computations of uh, fluid dynamics during the war, related to bomb blasts and things like that, was the first computer. I like to think this just reflects the British ability to keep a secret. Um, an example is the 2012 Olympics opening ceremony. There was a lot of press rumour in advance about the very beginning of it, which was a pastoral setting. There were about 10,000 people involved in that opening ceremony. 
None of them told the press or anybody outside what was going to happen after the first scene. I don't know how many of you watched it, but it certainly developed in a very interesting way. And nobody knew in advance what was going to happen. Another example, when we went round Bletchley, we were told about the guide having taken a party of old age pensioners and he was showing the Enigma machine to them and trying to explain how Bletchley uh, Museum understood that the Enigma machine had been set up. And one of the women in the audience, who was an old age pensioner, uh, said, no, no, that's not how it was done. I used to do it. And her husband turned to her and said, did you used to work here? Yes, she said. So did I, he said. <laughs> so 40 years on, they'd never told each other. Not all of the features of later machines were present in Colossus. For example, in particular, it did not have electronically stored programs. But many were. The term we now use, the arithmetic logic unit, was invented by Flowers. It was Good's experience using the machine that led him to develop, he was the originator of the concept of microprogramming. And if you want to know how it compared with the first generation IBM PC, there's a very interesting chapter in Copeland's book. It first succeeded in breaking a message in February 1944. And by the end of the war, there were 10 of the machines working on tiny messages. Uh, so they, they developed more and more sophisticated statistical methods. The Germans had some countering methods. One of the effects of those was it also enabled goods to develop, good to develop the ideas of statistical coalescence, and it played a part in the development of what are now called um, multi Monte Carlo, Markov chain multi Carlo methods, which are a standard statistical method of investigating a problem. I won't discuss in detail how these limitations, so-called, were developed, uh, but just that Tuck developed a hand way of countering them, and Mitchie and Good suggested that you could use Colossus to do it, and you could because, I won't explain how, because of time, but you could because the Mark II Colossus flowers had designed to be flexible enough to do this sort of thing, and it worked. So here's the second. This is the last one built during the war, Colossus number 10. You can see in the foreground the typewriter, which was driven by the machine and output the plain text. The large frame, you had two message tapes, so you might think this was like the Robinson, but it isn't. It's two tapes, so the operator can either choose to run this cipher tape or that cipher tape. So you could switch from one to the other and then reload the one you weren't using. Because these messages were from between German army headquarters, they were very high strategic value. Something like 27,000 were intercepted, of which about half were decoded, broken, deciphered. For example, in 1944, they decrypted messages directly signed by Hitler himself. The messages they decrypted allowed the British to forewarn the Russians of the German attack around Kursk in July 1943. They gave the Allies the German dispositions before D-Day. So the, when the coast of France was invaded, the British and Americans knew that certain of the panzer divisions were tied up near Calais. They knew they were not going to be in Normandy. They showed the Allies the value. They, the Allies were rather upset about the Italian campaign, which moved rather slowly. From the messages they intercepted, they learnt the value of this in tying up German troops that would otherwise have been used on the Russian front or elsewhere. As I said, the British only obtained a real machine after the war, although there's evidence that one may have been captured and then lost during the war. Unlike the Enigma machines, where various machines and settings were captured before and during the war. So since, it was, since the work was entirely based on deduction and led to the invention of computers, it's arguably an even greater achievement 
than the breaking of the Enigma codes. What happened after the war? Well, Churchill ordered the destruction of the machines and the destruction of the designs. And all but two were broken up. Two were kept, allegedly because they thought the Russians might try to use captured tunnel machines from the Germans to transmit messages that the British would like to understand the Russians were sending to one another. Those two were destroyed around 1960. The information about the existence of the machines only emerged in the 1920s due to, sorry, 1970s, due to a computer scientist and academic, Brian Randall. Photos were released in 1975, and in 1983, Flowers was allowed to publish the design, but without an explanation of what it was used for. It was only in 1996 when the US, 50 years after the war, published the information that the British had given them about the machines, that it became known what they'd been done. And then Mitchie, one of the authors of it, got the general report on Tunney published in 2000. And as I said, there is a working reconstructed one. However, not all the innovation was lost. Newman and Turing went to Manchester, where they built one of the first post-war computers. And I've already mentioned the ways in which Good and Mitchie used their wartime experience in developing their later work in computing and statistics. Tup became a fellow of the Royal Society, a very famous pure mathematician for his work in graph theory and combinatorics. Flowers sadly got rather little recognition and died without any sort of honours or special treatment in 1998. The last remaining member of the tunny breaking teams, Captain Jerry Roberts, only received an official honour from the government in the UK about two years ago and died very recently. How does this relate to the festival theme of science and culture? Well, I was told I didn't need in Poland to explain the cultural significance of the Allies beating the Germans. The other obvious influence is the degree to which we're now in the digital age, the age of computers, of which this was the first. On this trip to Krakow, I bought at least four devices which are computers in some degree. My laptop, which I'm using now, my mobile phone, my e-reader, my iPod. There may indeed be more computers in this room than there are people. I'll leave it there. I hope that's demonstrated the importance of what was done. <laughs>